Last time we presented some single fold split spread shot data. And uh, these would be the individual shots. Uh, this would be the spread for an individual shot from one end to the other. So we just have a series of uh, geophones laid out along the surface and we've acquired data. Increasing offset, I think you can see some uh, refraction events and shallow reflections. We begin to see a uh, Continuous reflector here, it's, it's kind of cut out by the uh, gaps between shots in places. It also tends to be kind of noisy, particularly in these areas uh, between the uh, shots. But we showed that we could get, uh, we, could, we could interpret this data and learn a lot about uh, subsurface structure and even stratigraphy. We could see, for example, here that we have a uh, structural high, it's a subtle one. But we can see that we're coming in a little bit uh, faster over here on this reflection event. And then the uh, uh, two-way travel time of this reflector increases. So we have a little bit of a drop here, kind of a monoclinal uh, uh, drop. So we can infer because of the thinning uh, that we see from here over here in this interval that uh, this uplift was ongoing during deposition of this interval. If we look deeper in the subsurface here, we interpreted some faults, and you may have a different interpretation. You might disagree with it. Uh, they're fairly uh, subtle faults, uh, admittedly. But as we get down here, we can see a very significant offset that a few of us would argue about. And uh, we can see that whereas the basin uh, was moving upward during deposition here, it was moving down earlier on in the history of uh, basin development. And we can also see some well, evidence of stratigraphic variability as we go from uh, left to right across the profile. If we take a look at this reflection event here, a lot of this could be noise induced and that's a problem that we have to address. Um, over here we have two sharp reflection events. Over here, not quite. It's a little bit different. So stratigraphic variability. Um, that we can see from left to right on, uh, as we go from one side of the profile to the other. Now, all we've done here is we've taken a, a shot, we've uh, sent a wave front, a mechanical disturbance down into the subsurface. It reflects off uh, the subsurface reflector, and these reflection events are returned back to the surface. So again, we only had one reflection point uh, per receiver. Uh, we get some data that's very useful, uh, very uh, with very well with relatively little effort. Let's let's put it that way. Now again, this is a single recording. This is these are the ray paths associated with the data that you see over here. So we get many reflection points, but these are single reflection reflections per point. And uh, we, we should also probably not, uh, we should probably realize that these are not actually, we're not, we're not imaging a point, we're imaging a Fresnel zone. So the response that we see over here comes from a larger area about these reflection points. And that area is referred to a, a, as a Fresnel zone, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the problem that we might have and that we saw, uh, particularly up in the shallow part of the data, and also just in trying to follow stratigraphy from left to right across the uh, seismic line, is that we have noisy data. We can't be sure whether we're seeing stratigraphy, whether we're just seeing noisy variations in the data. So we're interested uh, in improving the signal-to-noise ratio to get a, a crisper resolution of subsurface features, the stratigraphy, the structure, and so on. So one way to do this is to acquire more observations of the same uh, point and sum them together. And now you know, using this uh, offhand shot record, we have a source, we've got six receivers here, we've got, uh, we're just labeling the reflection points by receiver number. So we have reflections from points one through six to receivers one through six. And we'd like to uh, modify the acquisition approach to get uh, additional observations of each of these uh, subsurface reflection points. So one of the ways to do that is to, uh, and I've just kind of relabeled the reflection points here again, as we did in the previous slide. Uh, reflection points one through six, receivers uh, to receivers one through six. 
So we take our source, we move it to the right, um, a distance equal to the geophone separation, and we uh, detonate the source again, we get uh, additional reflection points. Uh, reflection points 1 through 6 to receivers 1 through 6 and shock 2, and so on. So shock 3, additional reflection points uh, down here. And then we just keep repeating this process, moving the shot along the profile, uh, just moving at a distance uh, usually equal to the uh, geophone separation. So we get a multiplicity of observations for individual reflection points. You can see where we've got um, 531, 642, do it again, 531, 642, combinations of uh, recordings that provide information about a common midpoint. And again, we're just seeing a repetition here of the uh, Records are received by the odd number receivers, 5, 3, and 1, and 6, 4, and 2, as we go out along the profile. So we have these source-receiver combinations, the 5, 3, 1, 6, 4, 2. Again, a multiplicity of uh, observations from, um, in this case, common reflection points. If the layer were dipping, this would not be the case, and we'll have to talk about that later, um, you can see where for shot one we have a recording from receiver five for uh, just isolating that uh, reflection. Uh, for shot two we have a reflection two receiver three, so we're just isolating that reflection. And then for shot three we have a reflection from the source to receiver one isolating that reflection. So we're just looking at the reflection ray paths that provide information about this uh, common reflection point or at a common midpoint. And uh, this is a midpoint. And so probably a safe way to refer to this kind of data is common midpoint rather than common reflection point or common depth point. It's often referred to as common depth point. But if you have a dipping layer, that's not the case, and we'll, we will discuss that later on. So, so again, we have these uh, traces, uh, 5, 3, and 1 from recordings 5 with shot 1, receiver 3 with shot 2, and receiver 1 with shot 3. And then this would be the other combination that we also showed in the sequence here uh, with uh, uh, recordings from this common midpoint uh, to receiver 6 from shot 1, 4 from shot 2, and 2 from shot 3. So we're just kind of alternating uh, recordings uh, from this combination of receivers to this combination of receivers and back and forth along the line. <coughs> so now the, you're probably wondering, well, what's the time distance relationship for the records in a common midpoint uh, gather? And so we just do, uh, we just go through, quickly go through the same kind of analysis that we did before for the records in a, in a single shot, associated with a, a single shot, the travel times. And uh, you can see that we have a right triangle here. Uh, so we have for this ray path here. And likewise for uh, shot two, the receiver three, we have a, another right triangle. We can see the, uh, the ray path here for that. Uh, record and likewise for shot three. So the analysis that we go we would go through for each of the recordings here in the gather in this uh, CMP common midpoint record would be identical to that which we uh, went went through uh, for the records of, uh, for, for the uh, recordings in, in a uh, shot record. So our distances, uh, x1, shot 3, to receiver 1, x3, shot 2, to receiver 3, and x5, shot 1, to receiver 5. We have a layer with a certain thickness. We've got velocities here. Now remember, for the reflection problem, we really don't use V2, but we had to have had a contrast, most likely had a contrast in velocity. Uh, we have contrast in density. Usually, if you have a change in velocity, you have a change in density. Uh, but we have to have some kind of a change in the uh, acoustic properties in order to produce these re reflections. So 
the distance uh, in the analysis that we went through before. We just have the this side of the triangle squared plus this side of the triangle squared. 2h squared plus x squared. The square root of that uh, is equal to the distance. The time is just equal to distance over v1 or the square root of 2h to the quantity squared plus x squared over v1. And then we can bring that v1 into the uh, square root into the radical so we have 2h over v1 to quantity squared plus x squared over v1 squared. Remember this 2h over v1 is just t0. So we have t0 squared. So the takeaway from this is that the reflection travel time uh, distance relationship um, for the events that are recorded in a common midpoint uh, uh, record, there it's identical to what we had uh, for the individual shots. So we just have this uh, hyperbolic relationship. So with uh, the next thing that we might think about is we're doing this in order to, uh, to, to improve uh, signal to noise ratio. So we have uh, three recordings of the acoustic properties from this particular reflection point. Uh, we expect that we're going to have some you know, most likely random, fairly random noise in the recording environment so that the signal will sum together and give us some improvement in the signal to noise ratio, the, the noise being random, it should almost cancel out. So we went through this analysis and showed that we had these combinations for uh, six receivers for, per shot. And uh, what you might do as an exercise, uh, you can pause the um, video for a moment and uh, convince yourself that if you had 12 receivers uh, in a line that you would get uh, a fold of six. So hopefully you've spent some time sketching that out, and you'll see that you end up with receiver combinations 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, 1, the odd receivers 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, and so on. Uh, these would be the recordings. Uh, these would be the recordings at receivers 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, and 1 that provide information from a common midpoint. Uh, if the layer is flat, that would be at the same depth point, the same reflection point. If the layer is dipping, it would be from at least a region which is close, spatially uh, close to each other. So, Now the next question that we want to address is how can this multiplicity of observations improve the signal to noise ratio? So we'll talk about that. And then we'll discuss the process of stacking which is really just summing all these records together. Uh, we have to NMO correct them, of course, before we can do that. And, um, and then in another video, we'll look at, um, take a more quantitative look at uh, the attenuation of random noise. Um, so uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, hope to see you next time.